there we go. Okay, so to start off with, uh, just a few reminders that we still are doing our community service projects. We're st still keeping on with those. Um, we've not received very many participants for the nursing home letters as we had hoped. Uh, there's 60 residents and we're hoping to give every resident a letter. So if you haven't participated or if you weren't planning on participating, <laughs> this is me begging if you would participate. Uh, for those of you who have participated, thank you very much. It is very appreciated and hopefully we can cheer up the residents Thanksgiving with these letters since they're not able to see their families like they probably have been in the past and receive visitors like they have in the past. Um, and we're also continuing doing the book drive for the literacy project so if you have some books to donate or uh, a couple people have purchased books and are shipping them to certain people's homes uh, if you're going to do either one of those options both of them are fine um, but just let us know so we'll know you know if something is going to magically show up at our house or if we need to meet you to get the books um, that, and we're doing that on a person by person basis because most of us are not coming on to campus uh, and after thanksgiving break people are leaving their dorms and going back home uh, switching on to an online method of finals so um, if you have any books and you need to contact us um, pretty much i think everyone knows my contact information you can contact katarina kuhn she's she's the one that sends out the emails every week or excuse me any other officer um would be very happy to help you out for that so uh just a, like i said quick recap we have the nursing home letters project uh extended the deadline on that i had said the 13th um because the thanksgiving is quickly approaching uh if you would rather just email me your letters i can do that instead of having to wait on the post office to bring them to me that works as well so we have the letters project and we have the books project so if you have any either of those let us know um and for now i'm ready to turn it over to uh, evan moore from surgeon cpa review thank you so much and uh, can i reiterate that uh the nursing home letters project that sounds awesome if you guys haven't done that yet do that because that would be super super nice to uh Bright up Thanksgivings. And I know with everyone kind of all over the place and there's just such a different landscape and, and all that, I do hope that you all have great Thanksgivings and great holidays and you stay safe and all of that. Um, but that's a great project. That's awesome. I, I really love that you guys are doing that. So I'm going to share my screen. So my name uh, is Evan Moore. I'm from Surgeon CPA Review. We are a CPA Review provider. Uh, so you're going to hear a lot about how great Surgeon is and all that jazz. And uh, before we even get into all of that, I did just want to let you know that even if you don't use Surgeon, you end up using Becker or Wiley or Glyme or Roger or anything like that. Number one thing to help you through the CPA exam is use a CPA review provider. Sign up for everyone's free trials, see how you feel about it, and go with, uh, you know, where you can find the best Get discount or which interface you like the most. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today talking up Surgeon that much. What I really want to do is ease some tensions around the CPA exam. So we're going to do a pretty comprehensive, giant presentation today that goes through requirements for the CPA exam, education requirements. We're going to do a multiple choice strategy. I'm going to talk about the Prometric Testing Center. I'm going to talk about the exam format. So I'm going to go through a lot of stuff uh, in a pretty short window. So with that being said, I will do the best that I can to answer questions in the chat as they come up, but no guarantees. I will 100% leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end though, so that you can ask any questions of me that you might have. And if I'm the right person to answer them, I'll answer them. If not, I'll give you the contact of someone who can. Um, but anyway, so let's get into it. Uh, the cameras aren't on right now, but I do assume that most people who are on today um, are looking to take the CPA exam within the next few years. So I'm gonna give a general overview of what the CPA exam is, and I'm sure that many of you know this already. The CPA exam is administered by the AICPA, that's the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. It's a computer-based test. It's comprised of four sections, auditing and attestation, AUD, business environment and concepts, BEC, financial accounting and reporting, FAR, and regulation, that's REG. Now, for each of those four sections, you will have four hours to test, and that totals 16 hours of testing. 16 hours of testing, when I say that, I get the look of this gentleman right here. 
this just like overwhelmed, confused, don't even know where to start um, confusion. I expect that this is a difficult examination. I, it's really actually kind of difficult for me to sit here and say, SCP exam's easy, don't worry about it, study, you'll be fine. It's hard, it's a really hard exam. But here's the deal. It's not hard for the reasons that you think that it's hard. It's hard because of that last bullet point right there, the 16 hours of testing. That might seem like a lot of time, it's actually not enough. You will know so much of what's already on this exam and there's so many different components to it, but being able to test all of that for each section in only four hour chunks is the most difficult part. Time management is what makes this exam difficult, not the material. So if nothing else, I hope that you leave this presentation and you don't get, look like that guy. You're a little more ready and uh, upbeat. So let's talk about requirements. I'm gonna breeze through these because honestly, requirements do vary state by state. I will say that every state except for Alabama, Louisiana, Hawaii, and North Carolina do require you to be a US citizen before you can take the CPA exam. It's a US-based designation. If you're taking it, you're very likely to be a US citizen. The same thing that goes with social security. Most states do require you to have a social security number and a proof of that, so your social security card, in order to sit for the exam. Some don't, but again, this shouldn't be an issue if you're a US citizen. If you are not a US citizen and you're looking to take the exam, that is something you need to work out with your state board of accountancy and your state society. I am not the one to look at citizen requirements, but just a heads up here. Age, all 50 states and five jurisdictions do require you to be at least 18 years old to sit for the CPA exam. I don't expect anyone's going to be ready to sit for the exam at 18. You would have had to already gone 120 semester hours at that point, but you do have to be at least 18. There is no age restriction on studying. I will say this though, you don't need to study too early. You shouldn't be studying your freshman and sophomore year for this exam. Realistically speaking, the earliest you should start studying for the CPA exam is the second semester of your junior year and the latest is the second semester of your senior year. The sweet spot really when you should be studying for this exam is right around graduation. Start a month before or a month after. Right around your graduation time, that's when you wanna start studying. Work requirements. No US state or territory requires any work experience before you sit for the CPA exam. But to become a licensed CPA, there are certain work requirements state by state. Again, with West Virginia, with whatever state that you'll be sitting in, make sure you check with your state board of accountancy or your accounting state society. They can get you those requirements. Now, education requirements are actually the trickiest one because those are the ones that wildly vary state by state. Um, all states do require at least a bachelor's degree and 120 semester hours from an accredited college or university to be eligible to sit. That equates to a bachelor's degree anyway. So in, in most states, it has to be a bachelor's of accountancy, not all states. And some states now require 150 semester hours or a master's degree in order to sit for the exam. Luckily though, West Virginia is not one of those states. You need 150 semester hours for your full licensure, but you can sit for the exam at 120 hours. So basically what that means and what that translates to in very, very simple terms is that with your bachelor's degree, you can sit for the exam. To become a CPA, you need your master's degree. Uh, again, earn your bachelor's degree to sit, that's important. And you have to complete at least 27 semester hours in accounting courses, 27 semester hours in business related courses, and six hours in business law courses. My source for that, you can see right there, is accountingeducation.org slash CPA requirements slash West Virginia. So if there's anything that you feel is disputable, please take it up with them. Uh, but candidates, once you pass the first section of the exam, you have 18 months to pass the other sections. Uh, we'll get into how that window plays in, but just like all other states, West Virginia has the 18 month window. But keep that in your mind, we're gonna do that later in the presentation. So I mentioned right at the top, the CPA exam is a hard exam, but it's a hard exam because it's a test of your time management and discipline more so than it is the actual material on the CPA exam. I'm gonna let you learn a little secret. Coming out of college with a bachelor's degree, you know probably close to 55 to 65% of the material that's already going to be on the exam. The key is filling in those gaps. It's learning the other bits of material and being able to fit all of that within the four hours. That 16 hours of testing sounds crazy. Like I said, it's not really enough, um, but it is comprised of three different components here. So not only do you have to master all this material, you have to master different question types, multiple choice questions, test-based simulations, and written communications tasks. 
That last one only shows up on the BEC section of the exam. The other three sections, FAR, AUD, and REG, are multiple choice and task-based SIMs only. And they're weighted like this. FAR, AUD, and REG are 50-50 scale. 50% of your score comes from multiple choice questions, and 50% of your score comes from task-based simulations. BEC is a little bit of a different scenario here. 50% of your score is multiple choice questions, 35% of your score is task-based simulations, and 15% of your score is written communications questions. We'll get to those in just a little bit. This is the way the exam is formatted. Testlets one and two are always going to be your multiple choice questions, where testlets three, four, and five are your test-based simulations, and in the case of BEC, it's the written communications questions. Between each of these testlets, you have an optional break. When you're testing at Prometric, you will see a timer in the upper left-hand side of the test on the computer as you're going through it. The clock does not stop between testlets. It stops between testlets three and four for 15 minutes. That does not go against your final time. Um, but if you want to take breaks between testlets one and two, two and three, or four and five, that will go against your time. I always say this, though. Take those breaks between the testlets, especially the 15-minute break. I my highlight is a little harsh here. That's better. Especially the 15-minute break, because that one doesn't go against your time. The... Breaks in between the other testlets, even though they go against your time, take them. Your brain needs a moment to sit and relax and reset before you move into the next set of questions. There is actual statistical data that does say that students who take these breaks pass in a higher rate than those who do not. So my recommendation, take the breaks. All right, study plan considerations. Now we're talking on average, you're going to need to be studying about four to six weeks per part. That equates to about 15 to 30 hours per week, depending on how quickly you want to go through this. I will say with Surgeon, you can pass an exam section in three weeks of study. That is a much more aggressive study plan. That's a very heads down approach. I don't necessarily recommend it, but I did want to let you know that it is possible. But here's something that's really important, right? And this goes kind of beyond just how many hours a week you're studying. It's how effective is your study time in those hours. I am someone who, and I'm sure some people on this call can relate, I become easily distracted, right? So even though I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna study for four hours. I really studying or am I scrolling on Instagram? And did I get up? Did I pet the cat? Did I get a snack? Things like that. Just make sure that when you're devoting study time, especially when you're breaking out a schedule, that that study time is actually effective study time. On top of that, when and where are you studying is extremely important. Are you in a dorm room that's surrounded by a lot of other people? Do you have family, friends, spouses, significant others, whatever, around you at all times? Are you in a room that's closed off that you can actually like, like I can shut the French doors behind me and make sure that I'm completely isolated from anyone? Um, and do you need a day off? I said that three weeks is a very aggressive study plan. And there's nothing wrong with an aggressive study plan, but studying seven days a week can put you in a headspace that really is a little bit too much. So when you're building out your study schedule, maybe you want to take Wednesday and Saturday off or Monday and Wednesday or something like that, just to give yourself a little bit of breaks so that you have the time to, again, reset your brain before you go into another study session. So the first three weeks of your study for any section, you want to be doing 50 to 60 multiple choice questions per day. Seems like a lot, but there's a key to multiple choice questions. It's really, really important, and we'll get to that when I get to the example. But after two weeks of that first three weeks there, like let's say this is a four-week study plan, right? Three week, or I'm uh, sorry, a five-week study plan. Three weeks, you're doing 50 to 60 multiple choice questions a day. After two weeks, you're working on simulations. And then for that final week of your exam, you're redoing all of your low-scoring simulations, and you're taking one entire practice exam. That point there is extremely, extremely important. Um, when it comes to the CPA exam, I talked about time management and discipline. With this exam, the hardest part about it, again, is cramming all that information in four hours, right? But it's also sitting in one spot for four hours straight and testing. That might be a lot harder than you think it is, and being able to do that and focus on the material at hand is a task that you're going to have to get used to. So make sure that you would do at least, at least one entire practice exam when you're going through your CPA exam study. Also try wearing a mask. 
We're going to get into Prometric in a little bit. I know I keep teasing a lot of things down the line, but we're going to get into Prometric Testing Center, but there is a restriction where you are going to be testing for the exam right now that is going to require you to wear a mask from the second that you enter the building to the second that you leave. Again, this has to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. If I knew when they would lift this restriction, I would know when the pandemic is over and I'd probably start playing the stock market because that means I can see the future. I truly do not know when this is going to go away. This could be two months from now. This could be two years from now. But all we know at this point is that when you're at Prometric, you're going to have to be wearing a mask. So get used to wearing a mask for four hours straight. If that means that when you're watching Netflix, you put on the mask and just try to keep it on for four hours. The reason why I say this and I really try to drive this point home is because I've talked to some CPA candidates who've tested recently. Some of them tell me, yeah, mask, not a big deal. Didn't even realize it was there. Other people tell me it was a major, major distraction. It was a detriment to their final score because they were sitting there fiddling with the mask and they were really uncomfortable. I don't like wearing a mask either. It is uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, this is the requirement. This is the restriction. So please wear your mask at Prometric, wear your mask everywhere. If you can see family members, please wear your mask. Let's stop the spread of this thing to get this restriction gone. All right, just wanna give you a heads up on that. So this is the most controversial slide in my entire presentation. I get pushed back on this one all the time. I'm going to give you the justification of why I firmly believe you should sit for the CPA exams in this order, but I do want to let you know that there is no set order in sitting for these exams. If you want to start with BEC, end with odd, then take reg and par, whatever you want to do, that's up to you, but this is my insight, having worked with a lot of students who have passed this exam. Start with far. I can tell people are rolling their eyes. Far is the most difficult section of the CPA exam period. It encompasses the most amount of material and it's the one that's going to take you the longest to study for. So why am I saying to do it first? Get it out of the way. We talked about the 18 month rule, right? When you pass one section of the CPA exam, you have 18 months to pass the other three. Get the hardest one done first, because realistically speaking, this is where candidates tend to fail more than any other exam section. So you don't want the hardest section with the highest fail rate looming over your head as you're studying. So get this one done and out of the way right out of the gate. Then move into odd. Odd is the section of the CPA exam where you have the most amount of experience and you're probably already the most prepared for. Coming out of college, this is the material that's most fresh in your mind. And a lot of what's on odd is informed by far. So it's naturally far into odd. Now I've talked to a lot of students and professors who say, hey, I completely disagree with this. I'm starting with odd because that is the material that's freshest in my mind. I want to get that out of the way and then learn for far, then move into reg and BC, maybe in a slightly different order. Again, there's no wrong answer here, uh, but I just think that getting the harder one out of the way first, the one that's going to take the most amount of time, getting that out of the way, and then moving into what you're most comfortable with, that's a better scenario. Now, reg, I put third because where else am I going to put it? Because I'm going to say very specifically end with BEC. BEC has those written communications tasks that we already talked about. It, it's different studying for BEC than it is studying for FAR, AUD, and RED because you have to focus a lot on your spelling, your grammar, your syntax, your sentence structure. Those are things that you're going to be graded on that you're not going to be graded on on FAR, AUD, and RED. And honestly, if you're studying sentence structure for your BEC section and you still have FAR looming over your head, it doesn't make any sense. This is a unique study experience. Nothing about studying for BEC is going to help you with the other sections. Do BEC last. That's the biggest one. I, I'll, I will die on the do BEC last hill because that really doesn't make any sense to do in any other order there. So again, the order that I recommend is FAR, AUD, REG, and BEC. If you have a different opinion on that, that is totally, totally fine. But like I said, I'm dying on the hill of do BEC last. Now, the numbers that you're seeing here, the average study times in surgeons courses, uh, all of that averages out, oops, sorry, all of that averages out to about 46 hours per section. That's how we're seeing students pass. Um, for a little bit of comparison there, Becker students are passing exam sections at 190 hours of study. We can get you done in about 46. So just a little bit of insight as to why surgeon can get you done a little bit quicker. 
So testing windows and blackout periods. Here's the way this works, right? When you're studying for the exam, you want to make sure that you've taken the exam within a certain testing window. And oh, wait, hold on, I'm lying because since June 30th, 2020, blackout periods have been eliminated from the CPA exam. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody who's seeing this information for the first time, but I do want to give you a little bit of insight into the way that this used to work so that if an advisor or a CP, an actual CPA comes up to you and says, hey, do you know the testing windows availability or the blackout periods? I don't want you to go, hey, what the heck is that? Uh, but I do want you to know that unless you are testing in Michigan, South Carolina, or Connecticut, this is no longer applicable. The way that it used to work is that once per quarter, there would be a testing window. You wouldn't get your exam score until the blackout period. The blackout period is when they would actually go through and grade the test. So if you took your CPA exam section, say you took FAR on January 1st, you probably won't get that score back until late March. That's not great considering you have to know when to schedule the next one. You have to do a retake, all of that. So we lobbied pretty hard with the AICPA. We're based out of Pennsylvania. I'm actually in New Jersey. Um, but we lobbied Pennsylvania pretty hard. We lobbied the AICPA pretty hard to get rid of this. And in all states except for three, we were successful. Us and other review providers and educators. So not just you know me, I wasn't doing it. But overall, people in this industry really felt like this was a very antiquated model. So what we do now, it's called continuous testing. It's a rolling application. You can test whenever you want. You get your scores back a lot quicker within two to three weeks instead of sometimes up to two to three months. Um, so good, it, we feel like this is a really good, uh, a good change. So we're really happy about this. But if anyone ever tells you about testing windows or blackout periods, you can raise your hand and you can send them my way and just say, hey, you know, at, at this point that is eliminated unless you're in those three states. So don't want to confuse anybody, but do want to spread the good news. All right, multiple choice questions and simulations. So let's get down to some brass tacks here. We've already gone through the requirements. We've gone through the actual exam structure. Let's actually talk about the meat and potatoes of the exam, which is MCQs and sims. So before I get started in this, something that is um, something you should be aware of is there's something called the Uniform CPA Examination Blueprints. This is a big reason why I actually say to use a CPA review provider, even if it's not surgeon, is all of the content that's on the CPA exam comes from these uniform CPA examination blueprints. You can find these online. Google CPA exam blueprints, you'll find them. The link right there is the most current link. Here's the thing though. It doesn't really get into what questions and simulations and anything like that. They're high level concepts. It's a 102 page document. The font is about yay small and it's completely overwhelming. The only thing I would really use this for is if you're studying something in class and it's confusing and maybe you don't know if that's going to be on the CPA exam, you can cross check it with the CPA exam blueprints and go, okay, this is something I need to know, or maybe it's not something I need to focus on right now if I don't truly understand it. So definitely cross check, but don't use this as your study guide. It's our job as a CPA review provider, Becker, Wiley, Glime, Search, and all of us, what we do is we take these blueprints, we distill them down into a robust CPA review course and give you real questions that are reflective of what you're going to see day of. I do know that some students use the blueprints as a study guide. I would not do that. It's a reference. It's a reference for us to build a better study program for you. But so let's get into a little bit of uh, study tips and examples for multiple choice questions. Now, remember I said that when you're studying for the first three weeks for the CPA exam, any section, you want to be doing 50 to 60 multiple choice questions per day, and that seems like a lot. The reason I recommend that is because you need to get through these questions pretty quickly. You need to be spending no more than 90 seconds on each multiple choice question. And if we go back a couple of slides, which I'm not going to do, but if we go back to the actual layout of the exam, you're seeing like 45 multiple choice questions per section, and they account for half of your score per section. Getting them done in 90 seconds is not easy, but the more you study, the better you're going to be at answering these. I'm going to get to an example in a, in a, in a, uh, in a second here. Never skip a question on the exam, ever. Don't ever leave a blank. You're all future CPAs. I would hope that you would know that a zero out of four chance is abysmal and a one out of four chance is much better than a zero out of four chance. Guess, if you don't know something, guess it. 
And the advice that I give, because I, I do this thing where if I'm taking a, an examination and I see like three A's in a row, I start to go, huh, maybe that question wasn't A, maybe that one's C, and that would, you know, I don't, there shouldn't be five A's. Don't play that game with the CPA exam. Pick a letter going into the exam that is your guess letter, I call it. I always recommend B. I don't know why. But when you're going to the exam, if you see a question and you it takes you more than 90 seconds to solve, you truly don't know it. You can flag it and move on to other sections, other questions in the testlet and come back before you close that testlet out. But if you truly don't know it and it's taking you more than 90 seconds, it's B, move on. You have a one on four chance of getting it right. You need to get through these multiple choice questions pretty quickly. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So this is a real question from the CPA exam. I believe this is on the regulation section. I'm going to read this question in its entirety. Now remember, it's only going to take me, I only need to spend no more than 90 seconds solving the question, but I wanna prove a point to you real quick. I'm going to read this. We got a timer going, ready, go. On January 1, year one, a company purchased equipment for $100 million. The equipment consists of four major components of which two components comprise 80% of the total cost and each has a 20 year useful life. The remaining two components have costs of $10 million each. One of them has a useful life of four years. The other has a useful life of five years. The company applies the cost model to the equipment and uses the straight line method of depreciation. Under IFRS, what is the depreciation expense for the year ending December 31st, year one? $4 million, $5 million, $8 million, or $8.5 million. Stop. That took me 38 seconds just to read the entire question. If you only have 90 seconds to solve the question and you already spent 38 seconds reading it, you already, already wasted too much time. So here's what I'm telling you. And don't tell your professors I'm telling you this. Actually, you can, it's actually pretty good advice. You don't need to read the entire question. Now, the more that you do these, the better you're gonna get at doing them, but you don't need to read each question from top to bottom. What you need to figure out is what are they really asking here? Well, they need to know depreciation expense under IFRS. What do you really need to know is that IFRS uses component depreciation. So once you've gotten to the root of what they're asking, this question actually becomes pretty simple to solve. $100 million is the total with four major components, right? 80% of 100 million is 80 million. You put that over 20 years is 4 million. 10 million over four years is 2.5. 10 million over five years is 2 million. The total being 8.5 million. You need to get really, really good at doing what this slide does here. What are they asking? What do I need to know? How do I do these calculations fast? The more that you do of these, the better you're gonna get at answering them quickly. But realistically, and you can start timing yourself, they shouldn't take you more than 90 seconds each. Once you do that, you're able to get this done in the most amount of time so that you can move on to simulations. Even though there are way more, way more um, multiple choice questions on the CPA exam than simulations, you need to spend the bulk of your time on simulations. But before we move off of multiple choice questions, there's something that you need to know. The examiners are using pre-test questions on the CPA exam. 15 to 20% of the questions that you see in the multiple choice questions are experimental. They don't count towards your final score, but you have no way of knowing which are the pre-test questions and which are the real questions. So I say, I always give the same advice, treat them as if they're the real questions, but you could probably smell a pretest question from a mile away if you're fully prepared. So if you've studied for a while, you're really familiar with this material and something pops up out of the blue, you're like, I don't know anything about this. Give it 90 seconds, treat it as if it's a real question. If you don't know it, it's B, move on. It's likely a pretest question. You have no way of knowing that, but again, there's your guess, num guess letter. It's B, move on to the next one. You have a one in four chance of getting it right. If you do, great. If you don't, who cares? They don't count. So I talked a lot about getting through uh, multiple choice questions quickly, right? You wanna get those done real quick, blow through testlets one and two so you can spend the bulk of your time on testlets three, four, and five because test-based simulations take a lot longer. 
I don't have an example set up for today, but if you email me after this, I'm happy to run through a sim with you. They take much longer. This is the bulk of the time in the exam. Remember, you have four hours to test to test for this exam. Your regular test-based sims are going to take you anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes each. You're going to see probably about two or three of those on all sections. Your enhanced, enhanced test-based sims are just like your test-based sims. They just have more exhibits. You're going to see one or two of those per section, and they're going to take you up towards of 30 minutes to do each. Each one takes 30 minutes. Document review simulation, same thing. Research simulation, 10 minutes. Written communications questions. There's only three of them. They're 15% of your score on BEC. Each one is 5% of your total score for that section. And they're going to take you upwards of 15 minutes each. This is why, this is why I say to get through those multiple choice questions quickly, because the simulations are going to take you much longer. Nothing to panic about, nothing, I, again, I'm not trying to scare you. What I'm trying to do is make you realize that the bulk of the time that you need to spend are on simulations. These don't, you don't move through quickly. These move at a snail's pace. Multiple choice questions you move through quickly. All right, so let's say that you know the format, you're all set, you've studied, you've done an entire process exam wearing your mask, you're scoring real high on the simulations, you're ready to go. It's exam day. What are some things to know for the day of your exam? Well, number one, do not study the day of your exam. You shouldn't be studying the day of any exam that you take from now until the end of time. Here's the deal. If you don't know it by the morning of, you shouldn't be shoveling cereal into your mouth, still trying to study uh, simulations for FAR. You either know or you don't at this point. And if you're cramming and you listen to audio lectures on the drive over, you're cramming. You're putting yourself in a bad headspace. Don't do it. Don't study the day of your exam. Study the night before. Study a couple days before. Don't study the day of. Wake up, eat a good breakfast, take a nice long shower, and get going. Don't worry about the material. You have other things to worry about on exam day. Another thing that you need to be aware of here is do not change your exam date. Commit to your exam date. Don't reschedule unless you absolutely need to. There's only a couple of instances that I can realistically think of that makes sense for you to reschedule your CPA exam. Birth, death, that's it. If you've got a baby on the way, all right, and the baby's being born, go do that. Don't take your CPA exam. If someone in your family passes away that's you know important and close to you, go to the funeral. Other than that, there is no reason, I don't care which season finale, which sporting event, um, which party you're missing out on, don't move this around. Because if you move this around, you're screwing up your entire schedule. The reason being that when you fail a CPA exam section, it might take a couple of months to move that on your calendar. If you have things stacked up in that 18 month window that are all strategically placed apart so you can study, pass an exam section, study for another one, pass another one, you don't want to accidentally fail this one after you've already pushed it off and now you're bumping up against the 18 month window. Don't reschedule. Once you've scheduled, leave it on the calendar. Circle it. Tell everyone in your life that you're busy that day and don't make any plans. All right, Prometric. Prometric sucks. I don't know how else to put that. They probably wouldn't like me saying that, but it's a pretty strict environment, right? Um, the reason that it's strict is for security measures. I'm only joking around. Please don't go to Prometric and get me in trouble. I'm just joking. Um, but Prometric is tough. Prometric can be a very scary situation. If you're not ready to go in and get fingerprinted and put through a metal detector and have your glasses checked, and again, you're wearing a mask and it could be a very intimidating environment. So I always say these couple of things. Know the location, right? Map it out the day before, actually drive there, sit in the parking lot, drive during rush hour traffic, see what that's like. Get there early. Um, if you need to sit in your car and scroll on Instagram or listen to music for a half hour, do that versus trying to run in there at the beginning of your exam. Um, also be aware that uh, there is no being late for the CPA exam. You're late, you're fa you fail, period. So get it there as early as possible. That's going to help you. Know the restrictions. Each Prometric, Prometric testing site is a little bit different. Um, some you will be fingerprinted. Some you will be put through a metal detector. Some they will ask you to remove your baseball cap and they will check the aligning of your cap. If you have a backpack with you, they're going to check the, uh, the inside of the backpack, things of that nature. 
And then the biggest one that I always say that there's really no excuse for is this thing right here, right? I was working with a student. She was already past two exam sections. She was she went with the method uh, FAR, AUD, and REG that um, I had recommended. And she was taking REG and she had her backpack with her. You get a locker for metric. She put in her locker. She went through the first three testlets, you know, multiple choice testlets, and then the first sim testlet. And she went to her locker and she took out her phone and she realized her mom texted her. She texted her mom back. She walked back into the room. They escorted her out. She failed the exam. If you touch this phone during the time that you are testing for your CPA exam, you fail the CPA exam. You cannot touch this. You cannot look at it. You can't open it. You can't text. You can't check your email. You can't sync up your Fitbit. Nothing. You cannot open this device. So my recommendation to everybody is to leave your phone in the car. Don't even take it into Prometric. Don't be tempted. It's not worth failing an entire CPA exam section just because you got an Instagram DM. It's just not worth it. So leave it in your car. You'll thank me. I mean it. Just uh, This is my GPS. I understand that you might use it for a GPS. Otherwise, I'd say to leave it at home. This, you need to text your grandma and your parents and your significant other and tell them I'm not answering texts for four hours. I'm testing for the CPA exam. Other horror stories and other things that are very easily avoidable, you can check out on one of our affiliate sites. That's ipassthecpaexam.com. They've got mistake, common mistakes at Prometric. Uh, it could be very helpful. But really the biggest thing that I'm going to recommend is just know the restrictions going in. All right, the future of the CPA exam. Now, I'm assuming that most people here are going to test before January 2024. But just in case that you're planning on testing after January 2024, there's something you should know. The AICPA and NASBA have transformed this certification. They transformed the test. They're moving to what they call the CPA evolution model. Under the new licensure, each CPA candidate is going to be required to exhibit core skills in accountancy, auditing, tax, and technology. Technology is the big change there. So that's your core skills, right? You got to hone in on those four skills. But then on top of that, you need to specialize in something. So you'll specialize in tax compliance and planning, business reporting and analysis, or information systems and controls. So it's changing the way that you get certified. It's changing the way you test. And honestly, everything that we talked about today very well could be out the window when they move to this model. I'd say this again, not to scare anybody, but if you're planning on testing after January, 2024, you're going to be under this model. Now, every CPA review provider, surgeon included, will have already updated their software. Right now, this is all that we know. You can check out the press release on uh, NASBA's website. I pulled this little screen. This is a literal screenshot from the press release, right? This is really all I know at this point. This is all that really anybody knows, but just be prepared for this change. When we know more, I will tell you more if that's something that you need to know. And like I said, CPA review providers will be way up to speed. No one's getting left behind with this. It's just something that's coming down the pike that you need to be aware of. All right, so how can Surgeon specifically help? I said I wasn't going to talk much, much about Surgeon, and I won't because I do want to leave some time for questions. But historically speaking, review providers have offered a linear approach to learning, right? You open the book, you start with chapter one, you take a practice exam, and you move on to chapter two. The study everything approach, honestly, it wastes a lot of time. You watch every video lecture, you do every simulation, you do every single multiple choice question, it's too much. So what we've done is we've created something that is personalized to you. We go into your review knowing that you already are familiar with a lot of the material on the exam. Remember I brought up the fact that going into study, you know like 55 to 65% of what's on the exam already. We test you up front to see exactly what you know, and we build a specialized course around your weak areas of comprehension. This saves you a ton of time. Remember I said that like on average, our students are passing at 46 hours, Becker students are passing at like 190 hours. That's because Becker's having you study everything. We only want to show you what you need to study. And because we do this, we can provide a ready score. This is accurate within three points. Uh, as you're studying with us, you are have full transparency into what you would score in the exam if you were taking it that day. It's overall by question type and by content topic and area. 
basically speaking, if we can get you to an 80 ready score in our software, we guarantee that you're going to pass the exam or we give you your money back. Speaking of that, uh, here's some of our student discounts. Uh, if you're interested in enrolling with us, you can save massively from what you would see on the site. These are our best uh, prices anywhere. So if you're waiting for a sale or you're like, hey, you know, I know Thanksgiving and Christmas and Black Friday is coming up, these numbers will beat any of that. Um, as you can see, our lowest tier course retails for $15.99. I can give it to you for $8.99. But even that, and, I, and again, with CPA review providers, use one of us, right? I can tell you why Surgeon's the best, but the big thing is try every free trial. Becker, Wiley, Glein, Roger, Surgeon, try our free trials. If you want to do that, I've got the landing page there so you can sign up for a free trial. Try the course for yourself, see if you like it. On top of that, we talked about practice, practice exams a little bit. We're doing free virtual mock exams for uh, December. We got one on December 4th from 1 to 5 p.m. and one on December 17th from 5 to 9. So an afternoon one and a nighttime one. We, this is a really good workshop. So what this does is this actually will give you full transparency into what you'd score. You get your ready score that I mentioned. So you'd see how accurate you'd be if you were passing the exam section. And on top of that, there's, there's really three things here. We want you to have insight into your score with the ready score. We want you to see what real CPA exam questions and what the format looks like. And we want you to feel what it's like to sit for four hours and do all of these questions. These are great workshops. We've done like hundreds of them since the pandemic started and I'm happy to be hosting these as well. So if you wanna sign up for those, let me know. Uh, also, if you're interested in enrolled agent, certified management accountant, certified internal auditor or certified information systems auditor, we offer courses built on our adaptive platform like that. With the enrolled agent course, we are strategic partners of the NAEA. And with the CMA course, we are strategic partners with the IMA. And if you enroll through us, you do save on your IMA membership as well as on some of your CMA entrance fees. Whew, all right, that was a lot, but we did it. And I did leave some time for questions. So this is my name and my contact info. I also have a professional Instagram. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I highly recommend that you do. I share a lot of uh, CPA industry news there, videos and things of that nature. That's what I look like on Instagram or on LinkedIn. It's pretty much what I look like here. Uh, and there's that link again. So with that, I will uh, take a moment to stop talking and see if there are any questions or anything that I can clarify from the presentation. So please don't be shy. Uh, if you want to dump it in the chat up here, go ahead and do that. If you want to just pop on real quick and ask a question, please do. Or we can sit in silence. I, I, I don't care about that. I'm only joking. But seriously, if there are any questions at all, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to dump my email in the chat here so that everyone has that. Yeah. So yeah, if there's anything at all, please reach out to me. I am more than happy to sign you up for those mock exams that we talked about and make sure that you get that landing page there, which I will also put in the chat. And I see Ashley is on as well. Hi, Ashley. So how long uh, typically does it take students to pass the CPA exam? So it, in terms of all four in terms of all four sections, you're looking at anywhere between six months to a year, uh, depending. Now, keep in mind, this is all also dependent on um, when you get your NTS, when you can schedule, all of that. But typically speaking, we're talking about six months. Gotcha. And when do you like, I guess, what order, I guess, would be a better question. Like, do you start all of this? Do you get a study material first? Do you register first? You like, what's the typical steps? So the first step, and there's some questions coming in the chat too, which I will get to in one minute, guys, I promise. So the typical steps are, first and foremost, talk to your State Board of Accountancy. Talk to your advisors at Marshall. Talk to your State Board of Accountancy. Get connected and come up with a plan, right? I know that I want to be able to pass this exam by X date. You know, maybe you're starting an internship, maybe you're starting a full-time job and they can provide the review material, but have an understanding of when you want to become a CPA. Then once that's set and you have a general schedule, then go ahead and try everybody's free trial, then pick a CPA review provider from there. 
All right. So I see Adam. Hey, Adam, how's it going? Can you set the ready score to 100 to be extra safe? Yes, you can. If you want to study everything, and, and this is a point that I make a lot between when choosing a CPA review provider. Uh, if you study with Becker, you're probably going to score somewhere in the mid to high 80s, right? That's great. No one is ever going to ask you what you score in the exam. With our students, we're seeing our students are usually scoring within the high 70s to low 80s. We're looking to get you to pass. We really don't care if you're scoring a 95. The study everything approach does what I would say probably over prepare you so that you can get a higher score. Um, but realistically speaking, we can get you to a 75. A 75 is a pass. It's a pass fail. In terms of being able to set your ready score in the software up to 100, you could do that, but you, Adam, you would probably be, would probably be wasting a good amount of time. Like I said, if we can get that ready score in our software up to an 80, you are safe. You're going to be passing the exam. I see another one in here from Max. Does the CPA provide uh, accommodations for learning disabilities? That's a good question. And, and I have actually seen that question come up before. The number one thing I would do is check with your state board of accountancy and also call your Prometric Testing Center. So double check from those avenues. Uh, when it comes to the actual testing facility, a lot of those provisions can't be changed. But if there's a certain situation that you need to for certain accommodations, make sure that you call them and, and work with them to see what those accommodations might be. Now, I see another one in here from Wyatt Riley. If we are in the process of taking the exam when the format changes in 2024, is there a plan in place for us to be able to finish in the original format or how will that work? Um, we'll probably be taking it around that time. Okay, good question. And I'm gonna give you a bad answer. I don't know. And I wish that I could tell you more, um, but here's the thing, I assume Assume, now don't quote me on it, but I assume that you would be grandfathered in if you already started the process. So if you're starting in late 2023, and by the time that you get into 2024, you'll probably be grandfathered so that you can finish that process, but I'm not 100% sure. If it ends up switching and you're doing half and half, I would also assume that the situation would be that you would be able to test those first couple of exams under the old format, and then the, uh, the rest of the exams under the new one. If you want to email me just so that you're in my system, I mean, I, once I know the answer to that question, I would hopefully be able to provide something a little more solid. As of right now, and again, I apologize for the vague answer. As of right now, I assume that you would be grandfathered into the path that you already started. I would assume that come January 2024, everyone starting at that point on is grandfathered into that. When it comes to CPA exam review, though, I will let you know, and we did this with the tech, with President Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act when that was implement, implemented into the um, reg section of the exam. We were basically looking at students and going, are you taking reg before or after this day? Because we can give you either study material. So if you're like testing right at the end of 2023, well, you could still study that material. But if you're like, hey, it's June 2023, but I'm not taking until January, that's kind of an unrealistic timeline, but you get my drift, is we would make sure that you're seeing that material. So that, that these, those types of questions, right? Those like, hey, what, how does this not affect me? will be smoothed over as we get closer to that date. A good question. Very good question, everybody. What else do we got? Guys, I promise you, I'm not scary. I'm only teasing. If you have any other questions though, please connect with me on LinkedIn. That's one of the best ways to reach me. Email is the other. Um, any questions about exam formats, testing, or about our course, I'm more than happy to work with you on. Um, other than that though, Ashley, I think I can turn it back over to you if uh, those are all the questions that we have. So I'm going to relinquish my great power of screen sharing and uh, stop my share here. I dumped my, um, my email address in the chat there, as well as the page where everyone can sign up for a free trial or get those awesome discounts on our course. So thank you guys very much for your uh, time today. I do appreciate it because uh, I'd love presenting in case you couldn't tell. Well, thank you. 
so much for that. And for a graduating senior like myself, it was very helpful and uh, very informative because I, this is something that has been one of those, uh, oh, that's like, you know, three, four years. And then now it's like, oh, wow, that's next semester. It's, it's coming up. <laughs> it's like, wow, I didn't realize I lived my, that much of my life. And yeah. uh, so it, that was very nice. No, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Like I said, I, I crammed a lot into one presentation. So if there's anything that anyone is uh, needs a little more clarification on or more detail on any section, let me know and we'll schedule a private chat via Zoom and I'll go through some of that. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah, but thank you cool. so much. That was very informational and answered several of our questions. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, and for the guys that are still left here, um, this will be our last like regular meeting. Um, so enjoy Thanksgiving break and uh, stay safe and uh, <laughs> try to uh, make it through finals. <laughs> that's, a, that's my goal at least for the next couple of weeks. And uh, for those of you who have um, voiced interest in becoming members, we will start reviewing the people that we will be inviting to the induction ceremony. Um, that's December 3rd. So right during the end of dead week, uh, December 3rd is a Thursday. So it will be kind of like our another event per se. It's going to be um, at 515 like normal so as far as the time slot and everything that's still going to be the way it always has been um just so you guys have any questions about that kind of stuff nope okay well um like i said you'll be hearing from an officer and inviting you to the induction if you uh, passed the grand requirements and uh, everything else checked out in uh, our membership review. And if you're not gonna be at induction, then I guess I will see you next semester. And um, we'll probably also send out an email, hopefully before next semester begins, um, letting you know what kind of format, if we're gonna stick with the Zoom format or if we're gonna transition to another platform or how our events are gonna work, things like that. We'll try to keep you guys up to date on uh, how all that is gonna go down as well as VITA updates, cause I know we'll have a lot more come January of how that's gonna work. So if you guys don't have any questions, that's all I've got. Any questions? Nope. All right. Well, have, have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody.